Lord Simon, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy indeed to be here to see and to address this splendid meeting in this historic hall. I am leaving to subsequent speakers most of the detailed aspects of our movement and of what we stand for. And I want, in what I have to say, to confine myself to the most general aspects of the whole problem. Man, like uh, other meat-eating animals, is uh, considerably addicted to ferocity, and always has been. But unlike most carnivora, his ferocity is mainly directed against his own species. That is a peculiarity of the species to which we have the misfortune to belong. <laughs> <coughs> I think that in the past, uh, although people have been as ferocious as they knew how to be, and have done each other as much harm as they could, there were limits to their skill and the harm they could do each other was not enough to wipe out the species. But now things are different. Now that same degree of ferocious feeling, which has always existed, is capable of wiping out the whole human race. And uh, we've got to face, therefore, that unless we can learn to feel less hatred of each other, we cannot go on. The race cannot survive unless it learns a greater degree of toleration and of mutual kindliness. <coughs> I think that uh, <coughs> perhaps it may be that if there were a nuclear war tomorrow, uh, some people would survive. I believe uh, that uh, there would be people still perhaps in Patagonia and the Falkland Islands there might be some survivors if there were a war tomorrow. But you've got to remember that unless we can stop the habit of war, uh, scientific skill will go on inventing worse and worse things. You will have bacteriological war, chemical war. You will have H-bombs more destructive than those we have now. And uh, there is very little hope, very little hope, for the future of the human race unless we can manage to find some way of putting an end to this mutual destructiveness, which now uh, can no longer achieve any of the objects that in the past some ferocious men did achieve. We need new ways of thinking and new ways of feeling. Both feeling just as much as thinking. We need uh, to learn to think of other human beings as potential allies and not as active enemies. We need to learn not to hate. It's a difficult lesson after all the millennia during which we have allowed our bad passions to run rampant. But we've got to learn it if we want the human race to continue. I think this is a gradual matter. I don't think we can hope that uh, the habits of many thousand years can be changed in a moment. And I think we shall have to approach the matter slowly. And those of us who feel strongly will have to learn not to be discouraged by the slowness of our success. I feel convinced that we can succeed. And I think it's only a question of going on and on, putting the case, putting it to everybody, to all and sundry at every possible occasion. And I think in that case, we shall win over mankind to allow itself to go on existing. <coughs> in the meantime, the only thing that we can do until we've converted the governments of the world, the only thing we can do is to try to find expedients to prevent the world from stumbling into war. 
accidentally, as it easily may do if present policies, policies continue. I think the danger of a great nuclear war is much greater than the governments of the world allow us to know. They must themselves know, but they don't want us to know, because if we did, we should say we won't have any more of this policy, it won't do. And so they try to keep us quiet and keep us ignorant and contented. Now, there are all sorts of ways in which a great war might begin. You know, of course, that uh, there are missiles carrying H-bombs, there are planes carrying H-bombs floating about uh, at any moment ready to go off. Now, take perhaps not a very, very probable thing, but a possible one. One of these might meet a meteor and blow up. Well, of course, it would be supposed that that was not a meteor, but an enemy missile. And uh, instantly there would be general nuclear war. It's, uh, the policy is based upon this argument that uh, the attacker will have an enormous advantage. And therefore, each side assumes that the attack will come from the other side. We in the West say, oh, we should never attack, never, never. And uh, the Russians say, oh, of course, we should never attack, never, never. But each side thinks the other will. And so we have to have instant readiness. Uh, the idea is that everybody must be ready at any moment to fire off an H-bomb. And you can't wait for orders from uh, Washington or London or Moscow, because it's assumed that they will be wiped out already and that therefore you can't have central direction. And uh, somebody on the spot will have to say, oh yes, go ahead, and uh, then uh, perhaps from an entire misconception, there's a, a general war in which we all perish. Now, of course, you would say, well, meeting a meteor is not really probable. I agree, it isn't. But there are a great many other ways in which things might occur. There might, for instance, be a mistake in reading radar signals, that is quite a possible thing, a purely technical mistake, which uh, might uh, make people think that an enemy attack was coming along. Well, uh, there again, they would reply instantly, because it's understood, you can't wait. If you wait, you'll be destroyed yourself. You have to go in at once. And uh, so it might easily happen. Then uh, there's another possibility which I think we must face, and it is this. The people who have the control of these uh, terrible weapons have a constant nervous strain, especially since they've been told everywhere that they can't, in an emergency, rely upon orders from headquarters, but must act on their own initiative. I think that nervous strain is very likely to drive somebody over the edge to the point where he goes a little mad. And if one single man in charge of one of these weapons goes mad, the whole world goes up. It's a terrible risk that we're running from day to day. And uh, I think if people realized how great the risk is, they would say we must have some other sort of a policy. On the contrary, Instead of saying, let us make the risks less, the governments of the world are saying, let us make them greater. They're doing everything in their power to increase the risk of general war. I say this quite deliberately, because the policy is, at present, to give the H-bomb to other powers besides the three that at present have them. The H-bomb is desired, by France and Germany, by Sweden and Switzerland. Uh, they are all, if present policies continue, pretty sure to have them before long. And uh, can you suppose that if they have them, China will be content to be left out? Obviously not. And if you give it to all these, why not to everybody? And before you know where you are, you will find that every state in the world has its H-bombs. And that will enormously increase the danger 
of unintended general war. And that is one of the great objects that we have in view to prevent the spread of H bombs to powers that don't have them at present. And uh, in order to secure that end, we say Britain ought to be willing to give up the H bomb which it at present has. <coughs> you will say this, you will realize that there's another danger when H bombs are spread all over the world. It is the danger of mutiny in uh, some one of these countries. It is just conceivable that the government may not be wholly wise. Such things have occurred. <laughs> now, uh, you may get resistance to a government which is not wholly wise. You may get uh, mutiny. You may get resistance to the mutiny. Uh, you will, in that way, very likely get the whole war started. I don't know how many of you remember that the First World War was entirely started by a certain terrorist organization in Serbia. And a terrorist organization that got hold of an H-bomb, well, there you are, that's the end. And that is very likely to happen if you allow these H-bombs to spread all over the world. I read a, an article in the Bulletin of the American Scientists, of the Atomic Scientists, an American magazine which tells you what scientific uh, people in America think. This article is by a Professor R.A.R., who is Professor of Physics at Cornell University. And uh, he goes into the question of the risk of war very carefully indeed, and concludes that within the next 10 or 20 years, war is much more probable than not if present policies continue. He says our present policy involves a practically infinite risk. I don't think anybody who goes into it can deny that. And I do quite seriously believe, and I should like you all to believe too, that unless the governments of both East and West change their line of policy, the human race will not exist at the end of the present century. I say that quite deliberately, and I think it's a very terrible thing to contemplate. <coughs> now, you know, governments are optimistic or pessimistic, as may suit their purposes. We can't believe the pronouncements of governments. Uh, take this question of the tests. There are two uh, vexed questions about the tests. The one is how much harm is done by fallout, and the other is how possible is it to detect tests. Now, on the former question, the governments are optimistic. They say, oh, it doesn't do very much harm, you know. Of course, yes, uh, be uh, some uh, uh, thousands of children will be idiots, but uh, after all, what of that? We can't be bothered with a little thing like that. And they take altogether a very optimistic view about the uh, harm done by fallout. But when you come to the detecting of tests, they take a pessimistic view. They say, oh no, I know that the scientists all agreed that you could detect them, but what of that? We can't believe what the scientists say. And uh, so on that, they're pessimistic. And they always take the view that encourages mass murder. It's a terrible thing about governments, but they will not believe the things that are necessary to believe if you're going to take sane measures to prevent this appalling holocaust with which we are threatened. <coughs> we... Oh, yes. Oh, yes, a traitor. Yes, quite so. Well, now, look here. <laughs> uh, 
Who do you think is the greater traitor? The man who wishes to see some people left alive in this country, or the man who pursues a policy that means that they must all die? No. If there are any traitors, it's the, the people who want us to go on with this suicidal policy, not the people who want it stopped. <clears throat> we have to stop all war, and that is a thing that people have got to realize. Even if we had the immeasurable measure of success, that we got all H-bombs, all atomic weapons destroyed, and an agreement to inspect each other so that they weren't revived, even then, if a war should break out, each side would, of course, at once set to work to manufacture nuclear weapons. And so you won't be safe until you've got some method by which you can prevent war from occurring at all. That's a, a long job. <laughs> some people say, and I dare say the gentleman who accused me of being a traitor might be one of them. Uh, some people say that it's a cowardly thing to want to survive. Heroes face death with equanimity. They don't mind dying for a cause. Uh, well, now, I uh, quite prefer to die for a cause if it's going to do any good, but uh, I don't quite see I don't quite see the nobility of saying that everybody else is to die too. <laughs> that seems to be... <laughs> Do you think that, uh, now let us take a concrete case, suppose that uh, a nuclear war broke out. Well, it's pretty certain that they would spare at least one bomb from Manchester. And uh, if a bomb were dropped up in the center of Manchester, uh, everybody who was in the street would be killed at once. But the less fortunate people who were indoors would probably have some hours or days or perhaps even weeks of intolerable agony and would die at last just the same. And uh, do you think really that as you watched your children dying and realized that that was the end of all hope, do you think you would feel you'd been heroic for bringing that about? I don't. It doesn't seem to me a good form of heroism at all. <coughs> I think there's one more thing I want to say, and that is a more hopeful thing. I don't think that we should let ourselves be hypnotized by fear of the terrible things that may happen. We should also dwell, and dwell even more, upon the good things that are entirely possible if once this terror was swept away. If you could get the world to agree that the interests of different nations, nine-tenths at least of their interests, are identical, and only the remaining one-tenth is not. Consider first of all the interest of survival. That is a matter which we all have in common. We all perish or we all survive. <coughs> and take again other things, we take uh, industry and agriculture and art and science and all the whole host of things in which, if once people stopped hating each other, they would see that their interests are identical. We are blinded by competition and by the bad emotions that competition produces. If only we could realize that we are all one family with one identity of interest, and if East and West could come to feel that, there would be a possibility of a new joy in human life, such as there has never been since man began. There would be a possibility of real happiness, real flowering of the human spirit, and we could devote ourselves uh, to the good things that man is capable of, instead of this devilish business of inventing ways of mass destruction. I think there is a possibility 
a possibility which is perhaps made greater by the horribleness of modern weapons. There is a possibility that men may come to realize their common interests and the futility of the strife that has existed hitherto. And I think if that should happen, the world will enter upon a period of splendor and happiness and joy such as has never existed since there were men on this earth. Every man and woman in this great audience tonight has to answer this question for himself or herself. Are you prepared personally to go up in a V-bomber and launch a hydrogen bomb or launch it by pressing the button on a rocket? To launch a hydrogen bomb, men, women and children. Second question, would you personally be prepared to launch this bomb on a city of a million men, women and children if you knew that the inevitable and immediate retaliation would be a similar bomb on your own city? If you are not prepared to do that, and I believe there are very few decent people who would, then we have no right to instruct a young airman to go and do it for us. I have been driven to this conclusion that the world is waiting for one great power to have the courage and sanity to say Whatever you do, we are contracting out of this suicidal race in H-bombs. We will test no more. We will manufacture no more. And we will hand over to peaceful atomic purposes the fissile material in the bombs already made. And I am convinced that this will have dramatic results. It will lessen the tension between the nations, cut the vicious circle, one government always waiting for the other government to act first. It will create that atmosphere in which it is possible to reach agreement. And when we hear people talk about making Britain great, failing to realize you can't make Britain great any longer in the military sense, we want to see Britain great too, but great in the way of bringing the nations towards peace. That is the way in which Britain can become great. For myself, and I'm speaking for myself, I believe we should go further. Because it is not enough merely to renounce the H-bomb if this country is still going to be the base from which American bombers and American rockets are launched. And I, for one, would welcome a request to the American government saying, please go home and take your bases with you. However, we are realists, and any progress in the direction of nuclear disarmament, we should welcome with our whole hearts. It's my task here just to remind you what nuclear warfare means. It's now a matter for all of us. For should there be a nuclear war, Every one of us will be the victim. Now, before giving the reasons for this statement, this is my conviction, I should tell you the difference between a clean and a dirty bomb. I think that the very fact 
that we are using an adjective clean to describe a weapon which can only kill and maim millions of people is by itself an indication of the level to which we have sunk. Admiral Strauss, the former chairman of the United States Atomic Energy Commission, even referred to it as the humanitarian bomb. <laughs> the difference, of course, is in the amount of radioactivity produced. But in construction, they differ very little. The whole difference is in the type of shell in which the bombs are enclosed. In a clean bomb, the shell is made of ordinary metal. In a dirty bomb, it is made of uranium. Now, the presence of uranium, apart from increasing enormously the radioactivity produced, also adds greatly to the explosive power of the bomb. And that means that for the same weight of the weapon, a dirty bomb has a much greater destructive power, a much greater range of destruction than a clean bomb. Now, should it come to war, which bomb will be used? And if, the, if we want, say, to knock out the uh, a rocket base of the enemy, we send over a rocket with a uh, hydrogen bomb head. Obviously, we should use a weapon which should have the largest range of destruction, particularly since the aiming accuracy cannot be very high. So you see straight away that the dirty bomb is a much better tactical weapon. Furthermore, because of the dis disorganization and due to their reactivity, we also have a big strategic effect. And it's for this reason that most people believe that even if clean bombs were developed, they're not there yet, even then, should they come to war, dirty bombs would be used. Now, we know now enough to estimate the effects of, say, such a dirty weapon. Let me take the, discuss the effects of a 20 megaton bomb, which is the bomb which was tested five years ago. Since then, of course, there are much bigger bombs produced. Now, such a 20 megaton bomb, the first effect which it produced is a ball of fire, which will stretch four and a half miles across. With such a bomb, we exploded near ground level, say in Manchester. If we produce a crater of that size, which covers most of uh, Manchester City, and within this area, everything, animal, vegetable, and mineral, would be vaporized. If the bomb exploded somewhat higher, the radius of the crater will be smaller. But then the blast effect will stretch further. We'll have complete destruction over an area of 100 square miles, and very severe damage over 200 square miles. And then you have the heat effect heat effect, which for people caught in the open, may cause third degree burns at a distance of 30 miles. That means that, say, people in Liverpool may be burned to death from a bomb exploded uh, over Manchester. And finally, we have the radioactive fallout, the fallout which will cover a large stretch of the country with a deadly blanket of radioactivity. The area may be 10,000 to 100,000 square miles, depending on the velocity of the wind. With an old western wind blowing, a bomb over Manchester will necessitate the evacuation of the whole of London. With a southeastern wind blowing, a bomb over London will make Manchester a deadly place to live. Now we are told that preparations are on hand to take care of the situation. The civil defense organization by all very uh, genuine, honest people, who really probably uh, mean well, they tell us that everything is prepared for evacuation, medical help, food supplies, and so on. It's quite true to say that a proper organization might save many lives. But unfortunately, the whole idea, the whole scheme of civil defense is based on a fallacy. It assumes that the enemy will only drop one or perhaps two or three bombs on this country. Now, if we could ensure, uh, be sure that the enemy will play the game according to our own rules, it would be all right. Say, if we make an agreement with them, say, we'll drop a bomb on Manchester, 
We'll drop a bomb on Leningrad and the world, the world is over. It would be all right. We might even agree to evacuate our populations and our treasures beforehand. But unfortunately, a future war will not be played by these Queen's Spirit rules. As Lord Russell already told you, a future nuclear war would be a war which will be fought within a few minutes. We all are at war. The enemy will put in everything which he has straight away for the simple reason that he cannot afford to leave too much, too many of the uh, rocket bases in the enemy's territory because he'll get it back. So he'll try to knock out as much as he can. And this means sending out everything which he has straight away. Now, some people say, of course, uh, the defenses are so good and the enemy hasn't got very many bombs. Now, this is not true either, unfortunately. But we don't know exactly how many bombs there are in the stockpiles of the great powers, but we can make some estimates. And from these, it appears that about four great powers have at least 5,000 of these great bombs, at least 5,000. Now, if you assume that only, say, one third or one quarter can get through the defenses, this still leaves us 1,500 bombs. Of course, Britain is not the only target. It will be America, for example, say, of course, Russia attacks us. But if you try to spread it out over all this territory, our share will be about 3%. This means 50 bombs. Now, I've made some calculations on the effects of this country of, say, 50, 20 megaton bombs. Now, these calculations show that about 25 million people would be killed straight away from blast, heat, and instantaneous radiations. And the fate of the remaining people will be determined by radioactivity, by the fallout. Even if people stay all the time indoors, in basements, and don't go out at all, even then, everybody in these islands, except perhaps in very far north of Scotland, will receive a deadly dose, a lethal dose of radiation. Everybody would die within a few weeks. This is the grim, these are the grim facts about nuclear warfare. And it only applies to nuclear warfare. One couldn't do it with conventional weapons. For the first time, we are really have the threat of complete annihilation. And as long as nuclear weapons exist, the threat will exist. We are here now, and these, all the whole population of these islands are in danger of extinction. Any hour, any minute. German, I, like many others who have been speaking on this subject in different parts of the country, am afflicted with a great sense of inadequacy in trying to deal with it. Not being a great scientist, having any great qualifications uh, to speak on scientific subjects, and lacking their authority, I can only speak to you as one who has seen something of the consequences of the failure of politics, politicians, and statesmen in our world at the present time. We are standing at the end of an age. We are facing the beginning of a new era in, in the life of mankind. We, British people, belong to one of the most technologically advanced nations in the world. We possess the power which only two other nations in the world possess. The power to decide the fate of man, whether for good or for evil, the use of this great discovery. And we lack the inspiration which can emphasize the common problems that we have to face, we of Britain, they of Russia, and they of America, in facing this great challenge of a creative force, creative purpose in history and in life. 
and as we move nearer, possibly to the brink of destruction, thinking that we can establish some balance of deterrence there, that is creeping up on us the great unsolved problem of the geometrical progression of the increase of the world's population. Every year that population increases by the whole population of London, New York, Rome, Calcutta, 50 millions every year. So that by the end of this year, the end of this century, the population of the world will approximately have doubled itself. This again presents a great challenge to the wit, to the intelligence and the integrity of mankind. We know that technologically advanced nations of the world are not saved from errors of bigotry, hatred, prejudice. We've seen how in our time a nation that contributed perhaps more than any other nation in the world to Europe's culture and civilization was driven mad, its youth was driven mad by myth of its own superiority. And how the youth of that great nation was led away as though by some demoniac pied piper of Hamlin. So that it was possible six, seven, eight millions of old men, women, children, cold-bloodedly destroyed, exterminated in the camps, gas ovens. We live too close to this thing. It happened in our time and we have an instinctive fear that it could all happen again on an even worse scale. unless we can find the solution to these basic problems of our future existence on this planet. Mr. Chairman and friends, I am very glad indeed to be here speaking at this most important meeting. I speak in support of the campaign for nuclear disarmament with whose policy I am in entire agreement. If we cannot get uh, total nuclear disarmament by agreement between all the nations, I consider that Britain should give a lead to the world by renouncing all nuclear weapons alone. <laughs> Radiation, whatever its source, is harmful to all living things. A big enough dose will kill within a few hours. A smaller dose will induce a disease now known as radiation sickness, which begins as vomiting and diarrhea and may progress to fever and delirium and a long-lasting anemia. If the patient does not die, recovery, even with expert nursing and every form of drug and blood transfusion, may take weeks or months. The course of this disease was first understood after the bombs in Japan. Cancer, as you know, is another hazard from radiation. It can develop years later, either from a dose of external radiation like x-rays or from the deposition of radioactive material in the body, such as radium, such as strontium-90. And perhaps 
even greater than all these dangers is the danger that radiation damages the reproductive cells of both men and women and increases the chance that defective children will be born and they will be born not only in the next generation but in subsequent generations for many many generations to come until the carrier of the defect is weeded out more blind maimed dwarfed and imbecile children that is what radiation will mean after an air raid in the last war when the sirens went one could relax and the, if one was lucky one could just start life again but there is no all clear from radiation it goes on and on poisoning everything with which it comes in contact this is perfectly clear from the civil defense handbooks and from a recent issue of civil defense today here's an extract prepared from an article prepared by the ministry of agriculture fisheries and food after a nuclear attack they say we should at least for the initial period think in terms of isolated communities and people having to fend for themselves with such food resources as may be available and they say starvation would become the most potent enemy for as they point out animals are at hazard in the same way as human beings and although the flesh of beasts suffering from radiation sickness provided they're not in the last stages is fit to eat yet the milk of dairy cattle is quite a different matter because it will contain both radio iodine and radio strontium and will be unfit to drink now remember wind scale that accident so tiny in comparison to an h bomb where the milk of all the cows on the surrounding farms had to be thrown into the sea for six weeks after the accident because it contained radio iodine again another quotation large tracts of the country would be covered by the radioactive dust which quite apart from its lethal effects would hamper the movement and, and transport from one area to another and as the chief constable of nottingham said it might be anything up to a year before the public would be allowed to enter some areas where there had been heavy radioactive deposition that's an optimistic statement as you can tell from uh, professor roteblatt's report what a black what a terrifying picture of england of europe of america of russia is it true it's official as i've shown and it's true now why do i say all this beastliness i say it because i think if we know the facts we can do something first we can support the campaign for nuclear disarmament second we can each one of us make our views clear to our mp and to our local authorities write to your mp ask him what the level of strontium 90 is in children's bones in manchester ask him what plans there are to evacuate the whole of manchester to a safe place free of radioactivity if it comes within a hundred miles of a bomb and finally if you consider that britain's greatness and britain's safety do not depend on our ability to murder a hundred million russians at the drop of a switch say that to your mp and say to him that you do not under any circumstances want britain to use or to have these frightful weapons